This is good. We are the Springs Church. Our mission is to get the life-changing word of Jesus Christ out to uh, the community, out to the world, so that people might live a, a life of purpose and fulfillment as God meant them to be, and we are glad that you are here today. If you're here for the very first time, I'd like to say a special welcome to you. If you're here, we hope that you'll find this a place that you can come week after week after week to get to know people, get to have relationships with people and with God here, and uh, we are glad that you are here today. Thank you, ladies, so much for being here today. Your music is beautiful and your stories are touching. It was great to have you here today. When I was young, uh, or perhaps I should start this with once upon a time, a long, long time ago, <laughs> I went through a period of my life when I was desperately lonely. I really didn't think anybody cared about me, not my friends, supposedly friends, or, or my family, or or really pretty much anybody, and, and there was a deep loneliness and a desperation to fill that loneliness led me to do a lot of things that I shouldn't have been doing. Uh, I started drinking so I could hang out with people that drank. I started doing drugs so people could, uh, that pe did drugs, I, I could hang out with them. Uh, I went through an endless line of, of meaningless relationships with women just because I was looking for something to make me feel like my existence on this earth wasn't totally insignificant. Obviously, that was the wrong way to go about it. Uh, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, uh, pertaining to that kind of pursuit of fulfillment, it's useless. Useless. Yeah. I am not the only person in this room that got started down the wrong road because uh, of following the, trying to follow the social scene and trying to get accepted to uh, other people because you wanted to belong. Uh, this, is, this is something that somebody mentioned, one of the ladies mentioned, it's called co codependency. Codependency. Codependency is when you get your self-esteem, your self-worth from what other people think of you. We all have it a little bit, um, some, some more than others. We're all looking for acceptance. It's natural. We go through life searching for some kind of a deep connection with other people. We're built for relationship. And being without it is, is torturous, really. That's why solitary confinement is considered cruel an unusual punishment. We need physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual relationships. It's one of the deepest needs we have. One of the deepest needs we have in life is to be understood, just to be understood, for somebody to get us. That's why we form cliques in high school. You know, we're trying to figure out who these people are, and then we, we, we are attracted to people that think like we think. Why is my best friend my best friend? Because he gets me. Why is my wife my wife? Because she gets me. We all desperately need to feel that somebody can feel what we're feeling and understand what we're thinking. That's one of the great things about being here at church. You get to meet people that sort of understand what you believe in, what's a big thing in your life. It's nice. You share your conviction with those people, and that makes for a great connection. Proverbs said, a sweet friendship refreshes the soul. Refreshing the soul is a, a big part of what we're about here, obviously, <laughs> as a church. And friendships are a very important part of getting through life. And every week I stand up here and say what I just said a moment ago is that I hope this is a place that you can come week after week after week to form relationships with God and relationship with other people here. This is important, this thing called connection. When I were at cruise shops and I, I formed my own church uh, at that time, like this church is called the Springs, that church was called the Connection. Connection. Connection to God, connection to other believers. So important. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, connection. Person-to-person -person connection, which can be tricky, scary, even a little dangerous. And person-to-God connection, which has absolutely no downside. It's often said Christianity isn't a religion, it's a Relationship, you've all heard it. But let's face it, it is a religion. We worship a God. But it's more than that, because the God we worship is approachable and available. And not only gives us life, but is willing to share our life with us every day. We can walk with him daily. And as far as connection goes, well, he's the ultimate connection. But today I want to focus in on connections with people. A study by the California Department of Health health, uh, mental health, found that if you are disconnected from other people, you are 
two to three times more likely to die an early death. You're four times more likely to suffer from emotional burnout. You are five times more likely to suffer, suffer clini clinical depression. And you are ten times more likely to be hospitalized for an emotional or mental disorder. In spite of that, most people, if asked, would say that they're not very good at connecting with people. They're shy or they're awkward. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to act. Learning to connect with people on a heart-to-heart, -heart, soul soul-to-soul level is one of life's most important skills. It, it makes a difference in every job there is. Without this skill, you're not going to get very far in your vocation. Without this skill, you probably didn't get the job in the first place. You have to be able to interact with people. Unfortunately, nobody teaches us how to do this. We learn about science and geography and history and math in school. Nobody teaches you how to connect with people. Oh, well, sure, we awkwardly try and figure it out. That goes back to that clicks thing in high school, but most of us figure it out wrong, or we never do. But without that skill, you're not going to get very far in life. So today, uh, maybe I'll be the first person ever to teach you how to connect with strangers and turn them into friends. Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California also had a lot of great thoughts on this subject. So using his ideas and my ideas, we're going to put it together and we're going to look at principles on how to connect with people. The first principle is this. Be courageous and take the initiative. Don't wait for other people to come and connect with you. You step forward. Take the initiative. You connect with them. Uh, no, I can't walk up to a complete stranger. I know, I know, it's hard. It takes courage. Why is it so hard? Because we're afraid. We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of being manipulated or hurt or used or judged. So we hide our true selves. We don't let people know what we're like. We're all experts at wearing masks. We put them on and nobody knows who we are behind those masks. We put a different mask on for each person we meet for each group of people that we interact with. We don't want to let people know what we're really like. Why? Because we think, well, if I tell you who I really am, and then you don't like me, we got nowhere to go from there. But maybe they'll like you a lot. Maybe you could be best friends forever, but because of your fear, you never even gave that a shot. Never opened up that possibility. You stop the relationship cold before it even gets started. Well, maybe I'll just hang back and see how things develop slowly. And maybe they'll come to me. Also, not going to go well because of that fear. Because they have that fear too. So they're not going to come to you either. Fears make us defensive. We're all afraid to reveal ourselves. Fears keep us distant. We don't let people get close to us. We want to withdraw and hide our emotions. We don't want to be open and honest, especially men. You know, I, men have a problem with this because we are taught from very early age, you know, just be stoic, be brave, be cool. <laughs> our fears make us demanding. The more insecure we are, the more we try to control or dominate things. We try to have the last word in our friendship. And that's not going to make us a lot of new friends. Our fear makes us defensive. When people point out our weaknesses, we retaliate and we defend ourselves. And that's not going to make us new friends. Nope. So we have to have the courage to, to take a chance, put ourselves out there. And how do you get the courage to take that first step in connecting with somebody? You get it from God's Spirit in your life. From 2 Timothy, For the Holy Spirit, God's gift, does not want you to be afraid of people, but to be wise and strong, or some, uh, some translations use the word courageous, and to love them and enjoy being with them. How do you know you're filled with God's Spirit? Well, one sign is you're more courageous in your relationships. You love people. You enjoy being with them. You're not afraid of them. Less fear. 
God, the Bible says God is love. Also says love casts out all fear. So the more of God you have in your life, the less fear you have. Good starting point in connecting with anybody is to pray. Pray about it. Pray about a relationship. Say, God, give me the courage to take the first step. So, yep, the first step is take the first step. Write that one down. You're going to write that down in your uh, The first step is take the first step. A couple, somebody else is going to walk by, see your notes and go, so that's what you learned in church. Good. The second principle for connecting with people is be considerate of other people's needs. <laughs> in other words, if you want to connect well with people, you have to be aware of, consider their needs, not just your needs. Nobody here ever had a problem with putting other people first, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's an old Chinese proverb that says, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. The Bible talks about this in Philippians. It says, look out for one another's interests, not just your own. That's a very counter cultural verse, really. Everything in our culture from the moment we're born tends to train us to think me first. Me, as a result, we're all disconnected because we're thinking about ourselves. We're not thinking about the needs of other people. If the world doesn't revolve around you, yes, you're very special in God's eyes. Yes, he created you with a purpose that he has to do, but the world does not revolve around you. It revolves around me. <laughs> No. <laughs> nope, not me, not you. We try to make it that, that way, right? We, we fool ourselves into believing it sometimes, but it's just not true. So if you want your needs to be met, then try focusing on the meeting the needs of other people. That motivational speaker, Dale Carnegie, once said, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. But some people are so needy. I know. Drives you nuts. But part of being considerate of other people's needs is making allowances for their faults. Nobody's going to be perfect. You all know those EGR people. It's a church term, EGR. It stands for extra grace required. <laughs> Colossians. Uh, 3.13 says, you must make allowances for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, God forgave you, so you must forgive others. Dear Abby once ran a letter. Uh, once, uh, you know, in the Dear Abby column, she once uh, um, ran a letter from a divorced woman, and the woman said, I'm 44 years old, and I'd like to find a man my age with no bad habits. <laughs> and Abby wrote back, so would I. There are no people with no bad habits or faults. But Proverbs 17 says, love forgets mistakes. It's not that you're blind to other people's faults. Uh, rather, you choose to overlook them. Great friends are good forgetters. They forget the bad stuff intentionally. They don't rub it in. They rub it out. And when I say rub it out, I don't mean like, eh, rub it out. Everyone who needs, everybody here, everybody here needs those kind of friends in their life. And one of the great things about church is that you can find those kind of friends. Here you can find forgiving, grace-filled people. And the third principle for connecting with people is be constructive with your words. Use your words to build people up, not to tear them down. You never, ever need to put somebody down in order to build yourself up. Ephesians says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's why support groups are support groups. They're not stand up there, tell your story, and then everybody tell you what a loser you are groups. The words that come out of our mouths are tools. We're used for construction and not 
destruction. Unfortunately, we sometimes we use our words like sledgehammers, smashing away at people until there's nothing left but a bunch of emotional rubble there. We use, we use them like saws, cutting people down. We use them to drill people with a sarcasm. Tool references. <laughs> One reason we aren't constructive with our words is we don't realize how powerful they are. I'll bet everybody here can still remember something that somebody said to you when you were younger, maybe uh, college or maybe even back to elementary school. Somebody says something to you that hurts you that still sticks with you. So here's how to build up instead of destroying with your words. Stop excusing. Stop saying, I didn't mean to say that. If you don't mean to say it, don't say it. Think before you speak. Respond. Rather, react. Respond instead of react. You know the difference? Reaction is somebody hits you, you go, and hit them right back. I mean, it's a reaction. Response is somebody hits you and you go, all right, maybe I deserve that. <laughs> you take that moment to think about it before you come back at them. That's a response. It's, a response should match whatever happened. You got to do this verbally as well. Realize that what you say impacts everybody around you. And talk less. One of the reasons we get in trouble, we talk too much. We talk too much and we don't listen enough. So talk less, listen more. If I listen more, I can better understand other people's needs. James said everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. All right, let's take a moment here. Does anybody here have a prayer request? Uh, the, okay. Okay, good. Let's pray for him. All right. <laughs> you laugh, but people do that all the time. You know how people walk up to me and they go, hi, how are you? Try answering them sometime. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Actually, I haven't been woke, and they're gone. <laughs> Take a moment, listen. It doesn't help to ask who's got a prayer request. If I don't stop to listen to who, what the prayer request is about. We set that up, by the way. That was a, I didn't really <laughs> cut him off. <clears throat> See, but I wanted to get on with my agenda here. See, no time for that. Well, did you ask then? How are you today? If you don't want to stop and laugh, listen to what the answer is, don't, don't ask. Just say hi. <laughs> but it's a, it's a habit. See, as Lewis once said, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. You don't get that without listening. All right, um, so stop excusing, talk less, listen more, and start building, encouraging people. Ask yourself, what do they need? How can I use a word of encouragement to build them up? Six months sober. Really? That's great. Fantastic. Well done. That's a lot better than, oh, six months sober. Well, you finally dragged yourself out of the gutter. Well, let's see how long that lasts. But people do that sort of thing all the time. How can you use a challenge to, to make a difference in someone's life? Six months, that is fantastic. That's great. I mean, one day at a time, man. It's wonderful. Next stop, that one-year chip. Look forward to that day. See, uh, encouragement. Or, okay, so you followed the... You followed the, the, the counselor's advice, and you wrote that letter of apology. That's fantastic. First step, sit down and write that letter. Now, now that you've written it, maybe you might consider actually mailing it. Or, even better, you might think about reading it aloud to that person. Encouragement. The fourth key to connecting with people is this. Be candid about problems in the relationship. Be honest. Being candid and being connected go together. You can't have one without the other. Genuine, healthy, deep, meaningful relationships are all built on honesty. Not false flattery. False flattery is a sign of a manipulator. 
not a sign of somebody who's generally your friend. Now, I'm not saying don't say nice things about people to them. I'm not saying you can't flatter people. I'm just saying make sure it's genuine. It's a good idea. In fact, saying nice things to people is one of the easiest ways, nicest ways to get closer to them. I saw uh, at a leadership conference I went to, the, this guy was introduced as being like a guy that everybody liked. There's just nobody didn't like this guy. When he came on stage, the first question the interview asked him was, okay, that was an interesting introduction from this person, but why do you think that is? And he said, well, when I see anybody for the first time that day, I say something positive to them. Every person. Hey, how you doing? I love your hair. It's so cool. Hey, nice suit. Ah, I love seeing you. Every day, I love you smile. I love your smiling face. That sort of thing. It's a great thing. That said, honest criticism or correction or guidance, however you want to put it, is also important in a real friendship. Thomas J. Watson, chairman of IBM, he once said, don't make friends you're, who you're comfortable with. Make friends who will force you to lever yourself up. In other words, it's okay to help somebody out. You can't grow unless somebody points out the things in you that need changing. And yes, you... you Probably have some. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Do you have anybody in your life that loves you enough to point out your faults? My wife, she really loves me. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Obviously, there are healthy ways to be candid uh, and not so good ways. Of course, but let me give you three good examples of being candid in a relationship. One, compliment in public, correct in private. Have you guys heard that before? This is just good life advice. You're going to compliment somebody, do it in public, you're going to do it with your friends, your spouse, your employees, whoever it is. You don't walk into a meeting, uh, you, you, if you walk into a meeting, you say, Adam, fantastic job on the Kleminsky account. You just, it was so fantastic. Good work, man. Good work. That's a great thing to do. But you don't walk in the same meeting and, 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 and say, Adam, the work you did on this is a little subpar and it was just all over the place and I don't think you're really concentrating. Do you enjoy this job? <laughs> See, for that, you take him aside into your office, into another room and say it. You can take your wife aside or your good friend aside and, and, and you can say, geez, I... I'm worried about you drinking, you're drinking too much. But you don't go out to a party and in the middle of the party say to your wife, another drink, huh? I think you had enough to drink tonight where everybody's around. Correct in private. Compliment in public. All right. Second, correct when they're up, not down. When I'm feeling good, I can handle correction. And when I'm down and life is beating me up and I'm tired, it's a lot harder. So think about your timing. Three, never correct until you've proven that you are willing to be corrected. It's a two-way thing. Remember, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Open up your life before expecting someone else to open up his or hers to you. Connecting means we care enough to be open and honest. I want you to think about this. When, who do you need to be honest with? Just think about it. Husbands and wives, this is essential. An honest answer is the sign of a true friendship. That's from Proverbs. All right, another way to connect is by keeping somebody's confidence. Somebody says something to you, you don't have to tell everybody else you know about it. This is all important in a group setting, by the way. In a group home, in a life group, in a recovery group meeting. You have to know that when you talk to those people in those meetings, it stays in that circle and doesn't go out. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. 
Proverbs. Are you the kind of person that somebody can trust with confidential information? We tend to think of gossip as one of those little sins, you know, it's like a misdemeanor sin. <laughs> Which there is no, no such thing of, by the way. <laughs> but in Romans, in Romans 1, God talks about, uh, uh, Paul talks about gossip, and, and he puts it in a list with things like sexual immorality, lying, hatred, fighting, selfishness, and murder. Gossip is in that list, and he just has it right in there. He calls people that do it God-haters. Why? Because it's incredibly destructive to relationships. What is gossip? Gossip is, is talking about a situation with somebody who was neither part of the problem nor part of the solution. Anybody else? It's gossip. And if we're honest to ourselves, we do it to make ourselves feel a little bit more important at somebody else's expense. We talk about their hurts, and problems in a way that makes us feel a little bit superior to them. That's the danger and evil of gossip. There's a story in the Old Testament about a family who struggled with gossip. It's, uh, it's in Numbers 12. If you've got a Bible, you can read along here. I'll, I'll read in, I'm reading out of the New Century Version. <laughs> Bible's a little used. It's good if you have a Bible that's used, by the way. <laughs> He's like, you like my Bible? Yeah. It's been in the family for years, generations. Never been opened. It's pristine. You don't want that. All right, this is uh, Miriam and Aaron and, and, and Moses. Aaron is Moses' brother and sister. Miriam and Aaron begin to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. He had married a Cushite. They said, is Moses the only one the Lord speaks through? Doesn't he speak through us too? And the Lord heard this. Oh, yeah. He hears everything. <laughs> now, Moses was very humble. He was the least proud person on earth. So the Lord suddenly spoke to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, all three of you come to the meeting tent. You do not want to be called to the meeting tent. This is getting called to the principal's office in a major way. Come to the meeting tent. So they went. Of course they went. Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent and called to Aaron and Miriam, and they both came near. <laughs> he called to them. I don't think he needed really to call them. He could have just gone. <laughs> and he said, listen to my words. When a prophet is among you, I, the Lord, will show myself to him in visions. I will speak to him in dreams. But this is not true with my servant Moses. I trust him to lead all my people. I speak face to face with him, clearly, not with hidden meanings. He has even seen the form of the Lord. You should be afraid to speak against my servant Moses. The Lord was very angry with them, and he left. And when the cloud lifted from the tent and Aaron turned towards Miriam, she was as white as snow. She had a skin disease. Aaron said to Moses, please, my master, forgive us for our foolish sin. Don't let her be like a baby who was born dead. Because sometimes a baby is born with half its flesh eaten away. This is a creepy book sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so Moses cried out to the Lord and said, God, please heal her. We can leave it there. See, look what Moses did there. I stopped there for a reason because Moses prayed for her. He called to God and spoke to God. He prayed for her. She was the one who gossiped against him. So I know that some of you have been deeply hurt by gossip. And the story of Moses and Miriam suggests that you should pray for that person's healing, the one who gossips against you. That way you can be released from the hurt that's come into your life. Maybe you've been talking about other people. The story is there to remind us just how serious gossip is and how hurtful it can be. It may not eat away at your skin, but it'll get under your skin, so to speak, and eat you up alive inside. Proverbs says it very succinctly. It says, gossip separates friends. The bottom line is when you keep confidences, it makes your relationships better. 
if you're the kind of friend that somebody can tell a secret to or spill them their guts out to, and you don't go around talking about it, it makes for a very, a very unique, very special, good relationship. The final key to connecting is be committed to a relationship. It takes time to build a deep connection with somebody, and it requires commitment. I have friends that have known me for a really, really long time. They have seen me through thick and thin, the worst days, the better days, even when I became a Christian. And believe me, I thought that some of them wouldn't continue their, their relationship with me. But nobody, nobody walked out when I finally turned around and said, this is who I am and this is what I believe. A Bible, the Bible says a friend loves at all times. That means even when it's inconvenient, even when you don't feel like it, even when the other person doesn't deserve it, even at personal cost. That's what real friendship is about. Walter Winchell once said, a friend is one who walks in when the rest of the world walks out. Today, with Facebook, I worry that this generation is growing up with not really understanding what a friend is. I have 4,000 friends on Facebook. No, you don't. You have 400 connections. You have 400 acquaintances, maybe, at the very best. And you're going to be so busy spending all the time on Facebook that you never take the time to connect with a live person and form a lasting relationship with that person. A deep, satisfying, intimate relationship. Those 4,000 people aren't going to be there in a crisis. Friends will. Get off the computer and get into a friend's living room. Big piece of advice for the day. One good friendship is worth 10,000 Twitter followers. So, and while I'm on that little rant, let me just say. <laughs> friend, I was just talking to a, a, a lady, an um, older woman, that is in her, about 90 years old, and she was telling me she went to Thanksgiving dinner with her family and how nice it was. But the kids, the kids at the table were texting. It's right then, and the people are having conversations. They're texting, they're texting. And then it turns out, this kid is texting the kid on the other side of the table. Do I have to say any more about that? <laughs> Don't do that. Teach your children better than that. So what do we talk about today? We have some great advice that came from uh, the Apostle Paul and Timothy, uh, and uh, some life-changing advice that came from the book of Proverbs. Here's the bottom line. You need people in your life who will be courageous, considerate, constructive, candid, confidential, and committed. How do you find these people? You make an effort. Because not only do you need them, they need you. I was telling somebody just a few days ago what I plan on talking about today, and they turned to me and they said, yeah, but I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of, of commitment time. I don't have the energy. I work all day. I'm tired at night. I don't have the money to go out to a bar or hang out and meet new people. Good point. Good point. But maybe there are ways to connect better with the people you already see. Perhaps you could apply some of these lessons to the people you work with or share a home with or go to church with. Be courageous and take the initiative with that person you see every week, but you don't really know them that well. Be considerate of their needs. Be aware of people's feelings. When they're sad, frustrated, depressed, angry, just you can feel that. Just say, hey, are you okay? You seem a little down today. Or if they're particularly happy, wow, you're in a good mood today. Something, something special happened? Life treating you good? Opens up a conversation. Be constructive with your words with people, like we said earlier. Hey, love your new haircut. Nice outfit. Have you lost weight? You look great. Be careful with that one. <laughs> 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 then, hey, when's the baby due? I'm not pregnant, you know. 
Maybe you could avoid office gossip. I mean, anybody works in an office? Keep confidences. Be that person that know they can talk to and it won't go any further than that. Something very special about that. Maybe you could apply all these lessons to the people that you meet here at church on Sundays. Maybe you could apply it to your spouse and your kids. And none of these things cost money. You don't need to go to a bar. It's probably not the best place to be meeting people anyway. You're not going to make the best relationships out of that. But no, try knocking on your neighbor's door and see what happens. I know. Ooh. Or this summer, here's an idea. Form a block party. Have a block party one night. You would be amazed how you will meet all your neighbors. Knock on the door, say we're having a block party, get, make out a little flyer. It's going to be at my house on this night at such and such a time. Everybody bring food and invite all your neighbors over. Does this take time and energy? Yes. Does it always bear the kind of fruit that you want? No. It does not. But it never hurts. And it might change a life. Or more likely two lives, theirs and yours. Because when you meet somebody, you make a connection like that, then you make a connection with them, and generally sometimes, uh, anyway, they, they connect you with some of their friends, and then their friends connect with friends, and your friends connect with their friends, and pretty it just ripples outward. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all men in the world. How are you going to do that if you don't meet new people? Friendship, caring about others, being considerate of people's needs, being constructive with our words, those are all really good ways to start. So my challenge to you this week is um, introduce to somebody you don't know. It's not a lifetime commitment. It's 10 minutes. Take a chance. You never know. You might make a connection. You got nothing to lose, and the gain might be fantastic or even eternal. Let's pray. Father God. This connection thing isn't easy for us. We are frail. We are scared. We are just not sure of ourselves. Help us have the strength. Help us tap into your strength. You are the God of angel armies. If we can tap into that strength, the strength that goes beyond us, just to step up to somebody that we don't know and say, hi, how you doing? And wait for the answer. Holy Spirit, walk with us daily, every day. Put your arms around us. Whisper encouragement into our ears. Whisper guidance as we go into these relationship things. Remind us to do these relationships with the people we, with all these, these advice, these tips, these things that the Bible teaches us, with the people that we know, not just new relationships, but people that we already have relationships with. Remind us to take what we learn here from the Bible when we're in this little building and to not leave it here, but to take it out the door with us and into the world. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you uh, don't have a Bible, we have Bibles over there in the back corner. You can help yourself. If you've gone through something, uh, a loss recently, um, and, and you're grieving, there's a, a grief counseling group that meets uh, on Friday afternoons at 3 o'clock, uh, not far from here. And there's information on that about that table back there. And if you've never accepted Christ into your life, today might be the day, the day that you might step forward and say, I want you as my Lord and Savior and change your life forever from this moment on. And if that's the case for you, there'll be a group of people up here right in a moment. If you need somebody to pray with, they'll be there, be here, uh, be here for that as well. And uh, if you've got something going on in your life, you know somebody that needs prayer, share it with us and we'll share it with the group. You can write it on your connection card, drop it in the little black box in the back there. It goes out to the prayer group and all. So thank you for being here this week, and um, go make a new friend.